Just now, I am a fossil insect person, so I'm going to talk about insects primarily. And the talk is going to concentrate on the paleoecology of the Black Death, looking at pests. So, if anybody is does not like insects, should look away now. <laughs> um, my interest in all of this started with my work from Amarna. 14th century BC, a new kingdom site, Akhenaton's capital, uh, excavated by Barry Kemp, and also with a very short period of occupation, only 25 years. So there are references about an Amarna, an, a plague in the Amarna letters, and there are other references about a plague brought uh, from the Egyptian prisoners to the Battle of Anka in Syria and ravaging the Hittites in the Musili prayers. Also additional references uh, to a disease which affects bubbles in the Ebers papyrus, which is dated 1500 BC, and references to a Canaanite illness, a bad one, so it's our neighbors, uh, which produced black spots from the Hearst papyrus and a similar description from the London medical papyrus. But this is the literary record, it's hieroglyphs, it's tenuous. So let's go and see what the data are telling us. I have done work from the main city, the elite part of the main city at Amarna, and also from the workman's village. And in terms of the fauna, the preservation was fantastic. And one of the most interesting things were pests of stored products, which were brought from different areas. So this assemblage, included species which came from the Fertile Crescent, Cytorculus granarius, from uh, the Near East, and also from India. A highly cosmopolitan assemblage which was established during the New Kingdom at Amarna, showing that there were strong redistribution links with other areas. And also, another part of my fauna um, would be in place in areas of the Garden City in Cairo. And that goes both for the elite part of the city and the workman's village, the area where the poor people lived. So it was packed with house flies, and they're causing a range of diseases. Uh, they are known for causing ophthalmia, and also ectoparasites. So from these, the most interesting ones in terms of plague are uh, Pulex irritans, which is a secondary vector of plague. It's known to spread it in severe epidemics. And also the cat flea, which will spread it to cats and dogs, and there, from there on it will infect humans. Again, they are secondary vectors and not primary vectors. We are already uh, told about the ecology of the disease, but basically you find it in the natural reservoirs, the main vector, and that's why I'm here, because the main vector is an insect, the Noxilachiaopis, will um, infect wild rodents, and the disease will be contained there because wild rodents and the Noxilachiaopis co-involve, so there is an immunity to the disease. And the problem starts when a new species is introduced, so it has low immunity to the disease and it starts spreading. And we were told about uh, infected fleas um, biting the uh, new species with low immunity, its gut being clogged with the bacteria, and then the fleas regurgitate the, the blood into other animals that they are biting in order to feed. They are hungry and they bite fiercely everything around them. And in this process, humans and other vertebrates get infected. Then more fleas, uh, the cat fleas and the human fleas, get into all of this uh, equation. The humans get infected, you can get bubonic plague in urban reservoirs, and the disease starts spreading, spreading out. Um, now, why did I think that a good place for the origins of the disease is Egypt? Because the main vector, the Noxilachiaopis, is endemic around the Nile. Actually, it was described under the pyramid of Cheops by Rothschild, and also, uh, it lives on the back of the Nile rat, uh, 
the African grass rat, which is again endemic around the Nile. And they, are in, they were in wild reservoirs, there wouldn't be any problem until the point where the African human period is terminated. There is weakening of the monsoons, and as a result of the uh, retreating mon uh, monsoonal rainfalls, we've got desiccation of the Saqqara de Desert around 5300 BC and concentration of settlement around the Nile, which brings the Nile rat and the rat flea together with humans in close vicinity. And of course, the Nile is very important for Egypt. Um, the management of the waters of the Nile is the cornerstone of the Egyptian state. So at their highest point, um, the Nile annual floods will cover all the surrounding area, um, and only areas which are higher than that will be free of water. And this process brings the Nile rat and the flea inside the areas where people live. So we know that the uh, Nile rat was there because we have it in various representations, even cartoon-style representations. But what happens with a black rat? When does this come in? Because this is important for the spread of the disease. This is a species with Indian origin. So there must be some contact, some means of bringing the black rat to Egypt so you can have the disease start spreading. And the main way of contact would be the lapis lazuli trade, or that's what I think. <laughs> so we've got it, we've got imports from the Sarisank uh, mines of lapis lazuli in Egypt uh, since 5000 BC at least. And we have an active network um, and areas uh, or sites which are redistribution centers, and uh, they would redistribute. Uh, lapis lazuli over to Mesopotamia, in the India, and other areas. Sacris octa is one of these. And if you look at the insect fauna from Sacris octa, and there is limited work by Costandini, which is dated now, it is a subset of what I had from Amarna, which means that they are probably in the same trade link. So, in terms of sites with black. Uh, with evidence for black rat, all the uh, sites in this map uh, from the Indus Valley civilization produce data for black rat bones for um, areas from, uh, uh, from settlements since 2600 BC. The earlier black rat records come from the Levantine coast, but they are not from uh, settled areas. We've got the Daba record from 1600 BC by the late Bosnik, and then when the Romans come in, uh, we've got various records, I have a few here. Uh, the Romans take over that trade, uh, they follow the monsoons, and they, they are far more efficient in trading with India. So overall, if you look at the data, and there is a debated um, evidence from a mummy about plague, uh, by Ruffer, uh, there is everything there. It's pretty much a ticking bomb. The disease waits to start, and that's the main hypothesis. So, in addition to the Nile floods, uh, there is an important element uh, for the Nile uh, because it is a way of distributing uh, goods, including grain. And the fleas can travel very well within grain, because they can live there without feeding for quite a while. So what about the Romans? Well, Egypt was a granary, uh, their, their granary, so they are trading with Egypt, and grain is going backwards and forwards together with lapis lazuli. And there are uh, historical records that the Justinian plague, which is a Byzantine plague, started from Pelusium or Axum, depending whether um, you believe Procopius or Evagrius. And in terms of black rat records, and this is Rufino and Vidal's map, there are a few more from Egypt which are not included there. Uh, the evidence shows that 
Black rats were well established in uh, the Mediterranean coast uh, during the Roman period. You need to take into account that the research is very thin. And recently, I don't know of many sites that are saving for obtaining rat bones, or actually how many sites are producing insect remains. We have no records for the Nopsila Keopis. In terms of um, flea records from Palearctic sites, these are all our data. So again, this is limited. And I want to stress that Culex agent is a secondary vector, but this is interesting because after looking at more of 300 uh, Palearctic sites which have produced data, this is what we have. And it shows that the distribution of sites, these are sites and not actual numbers, um, peaked during the medieval period. Does this mean anything? Perhaps it means something about the plague because there is a secondary vector which would um, spread the disease in, um, during, severe during a severe epidemic like the medieval plague. In terms of numbers, and of course differential preservation and taphonomy make that not be extremely valid, during the Roman period we got less than 100 specimens, whilst during the medieval period where we have several thousand specimens from all of these sites. So was it the medieval warm period which was important for all of this? In, for the rats and the fleas, the microclimate is more important than the microclimate, but perhaps the microclimate played some role in terms of optimal conditions for the host and the vector. But again, uh, one can think that this happened because there were too many people or more people than what you had in the medieval period, so more fleas. There are a lot of things to be taken into account, but just another piece of evidence. So. To sum up the research on plague overall, from the paleo record there is very little indeed. And we do need to do more research from areas on the Lapis uh, trade route to see whether there is any information for the initial spread of the disease. We need to look at sites for insects during the Justinian and the medieval plague. As I said, there is hardly any saving for small mammals. So the records that we have for rats is limited, and we are still waiting for a methodology for the extraction of fossil insect DNA. Thank you very much.